Good morning. It is a good morning to be with everybody. It's great to see everyone who's uh, with us today. As we turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, I want us to, to think about something just briefly for a moment, and then we'll, dis- we'll discuss why I believe this is. When we look around the world today, there's a lot of people who say that they follow Jesus, and yet there's so many different teachings and different ways and, and different lifestyles that, that people espouse, that people live and hold on to. And they say that they're following Jesus, and yet we have a single word. God has given us a word that we can read and study and know the mind of God, and so we can follow him in a similar, in a similar manner. And when we think about just that idea, you know, what's happened is that somebody has manipulated, changed, or, or made the word of God to say different things or actually made it of no effect in their life. It's like this. When we think about God's word, he has given us all that, all it needs to be known for life and godliness, and if we cha- start changing it, it becomes something different. If I start changing the Word of God, it's no longer the Word of God, it's, well, my words that I've added to the Word of God. I've manipulated it, I've corrupted it, I've changed it. If other people have manipulated or changed or made God's Word to say something that it ought not say or does not say, and then they have made their own Word, it's no longer God's Word. And so when we look this morning at this idea not to go beyond what is written. I want us to think about just that, that just the idea, if, if we just gave the Bible the credence that it has, if we looked at God's Word as being God's Word and sought to understand it as God's Word, then we would live in a, in a similar manner. And yet sometimes we, are, we, we may be tempted to go beyond what is written. When we look here in, in 1 Corinthians, I want us to first of all think about the situation. Why did Paul do this? After all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he said he uh, figurative, figuratively transferred these things onto Apollos and himself. And so well, what was going on that he transferred on himself, that he was encouraging them not to go beyond what is written or, or God's word. And when we go back and we look in, in, ver- in chapter 1, we notice this. Starting in verse 10, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Cloyd's household, that there are contentions among you. So the first thing we can think about this situation is there, well, there's fightings among themselves. There's fightings, there's divisions, they're not unified, they're disunified, they're against one another. So much so they're arguing. And notice what he goes on to say in verse 12. He says, Now this, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And the answer to all those in verse 13 should be no. Should be no. But just think about what they were doing. They're, they're grabbing on to preachers' coattails. And they're kind of riding his wave, so to speak, into the congregation and trying to get some prominence. It's almost as if to say, who, who taught you or who baptized you? Well, Peter baptized me, that'd be Cephas. And, and so I've got something because Peter baptized me. Or maybe it's Apollos, and Apollos baptized me. Or maybe it was Peter and Paul, and, and so they're trying to claim this, and someone say, well, I'm of Jesus. Now, first of all, why would you want to dispute with somebody who says, I follow Jesus? And then claim to follow somebody else. If indeed you are a Christian, one that follows God's word, one that wants to to be with Jesus, why would you want to have this religious division? And so this is what's going on here in Corinth. There's a division, and not only that, notice in chapter 2, what we find here. It is that they are not only having division, uh, but they believe themselves to be wise when they were not. They believe themselves to be wise when they were not. Notice it's starting in it's verse 9 or verse 11. Notice verse 11. For the things, it's actually chapter 1 and verse 18. If I find it, we'll get it out here. Notice what it has two on here. I'm like, I know the thing, two, because they ain't. There's not 18 verses, but here it is. It says this in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. He says, for, this, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are 
being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of foolishness of the message priest to save those who believe for the jews request a sign and greeks seek after wisdom but we preach christ crucified to the jews a stumbling block and to the greeks foolishness but to those who are called both jews and greeks christ is the power of god and the salvation of god so when we look at this and it goes on in verse 25 because the foolishness of god is wiser than men and the weakness of god is stronger than men so that goes on to say this idea we have the foolishness of the cross. Some people say, well, Jesus died. He, he's supposed to be this victorious Savior. How can he save you if he dies? There has to be something different. Have you ever not had, have you had somebody tell, talk to you about, about something about Scripture and say, you know, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Maybe it's lying. I generally use lying. It's something that we all can uh, identify with at least some point in our lives. We say, I know it's not good to tell a lie, but then it out it comes. We tell it. I know it's not good. Why are you late? Well, really what happened was it wasn't the traffic. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't so and so else's fault. When you wake up 30 minutes late, you're going to be late. It don't matter how fast you drive. And you know, we sit back and say, well, I'm not, I don't like the lie, but if I have to get my way out of it, this, I, I, I can do that. I can finagle some numbers. Have you ever sat and thought about that idea? As, as we fill out tax return forms, I know it's not that time of year, but if we finagle numbers, that's the same thing as lying and stealing? Oh, it's okay. They got lots of money. Do they? How much in debt are we? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? And so when we sit down and think about these things, we might be tempted to say, well, it's not that bad, and we start using our own wisdom over against what God's wisdom is. What's God's wisdom? It's always best to tell the truth. What did God say about stealing? Don't do it. I mean, really think about these things. Think about forgiveness. The idea is, you know, has anybody ever done you wrong? And you say, well, I forgive you, but I'll never forget. But what, what does Jesus want us to do? God wants us to forgive and not act like it happened. Like, truly go on with life. Not allowing that to impact a relationship. And so when we think about this, this, this idea of the wisdom of men, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble because we might say, well, God will understand if I do this. I know his word says that, but he will understand if I do this. Well, if God's word didn't say it, then I don't know he'll understand why we're not doing what we're supposed to or why we do what we're not supposed to do. See, that's really something to think about. Some people are saying, we're wise. We're wise. There's divisions, and they think they're wise. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. They're not spiritually minded. They're carnally minded. Notice what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. It reads, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are, you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For the where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? And carnal is worldly minded. And you think, well, what's worldly minded? It's against what God wants. See, it's not spiritually mindedness. See, when we think about ourselves as far as Christianity is concerned and as far as, as when God sees us, we're all on the same plane here. I mean, all of us need a Savior. I wouldn't ask for a raise of hands if you don't. But the idea is we all need a Savior, right? We're all on the same plane. We're all on the same field. We still have sin in our life that needs to be forgiven and taken care of. You might sit back and say, well, I can't lead singing or I can't preach. Well, that's okay. You don't have to. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The idea is there's different abilities we have, and that makes it wonderful and beautiful to come together. 
Because now we have all of these different ideas, all these different talents and abilities coming together. It's a wonderful thing. We don't all have to do the same thing. But we still got to follow God. Carnally minded, they're willing to buy and devour and separate themselves based on the desire that they have, not what God's Word says. Not what God's Word says. And so when we sit down and we think about this, they're arguing among themselves in an unholy manner. It's not what God wants. It's because they're being worldly minded and not thinking the things that God would have them to think. And so Paul cannot even talk to them as being spiritual because they are wanting not to follow God the way they ought to. Notice if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, our scripture reading. Notice how it goes on to say, Now, now these things, brethren, I have figured to be transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Now the word puffed up is interesting. The word puffed up literally means with pride. So I looked it up. I said, what is this word? I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's odd. I mean, we have puffed up here. We have puffed up in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What's the deal? The original word means to be arrogant or made proud. So they have the big eye, little you syndrome. A bunch of them. Now, could you imagine singing Amazing Grace with people who think they're better than you? Could you imagine singing What a Friend We Have with Jesus with people who are lower than you? See, that's how they were thinking. They were puffed up. They were arrogant. They were proud. Now, when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, some of that is because of this man who's living with his father's wife. But there's other things in it. Who baptized you? Who taught you? Oh, you're, you, this is what God's Word says, but we'll go a little step further. Is that, it's that wisdom piece. And so when we sit down and we look at this, this idea, they had a lot of problem. Why? Because the world's not focusing on what God wanted them to be doing. They were focusing on their own lives and not on the things they ought to do. I'll give an example. Have you ever sat in a math class, maybe in middle school or high school, when, you, when that was a big important thing at the time, you were in math class? And, and you had this teacher that said, you had to do it exactly this way. And yet you look at him and say, well, if I do this, I get the same answer. You ever been there? You know, there's more than one way to do a math problem. As long as the numbers work right and it's good arithmetic, you're going to get the same answer. You're going to. There's things you can do. When we sit down and think about these things, and we think about what God's Word says, there's a way you, we live it out. But we've got to hold on to it. And we can't look at somebody and say, well, my way is better. I mean, after all, I could literally look at you and say, well, how many of you guys have preached to a number of this size today? Well, none. That's okay. But I wouldn't say that either. You know, what I'm saying is there are times that we would say, I do this and this and this and this. What are you doing? Well, wait a minute. Is that the right attitude about this, this, and this we ought to have? Is this the right attitude about what are you doing that we ought to have? Now, we can encourage each other to do different things. That's one thing. But to sit down and say, I have all the right answers, and go astray from what God has said, that's a whole different thing. And so when we consider ourselves followers of God, what we have to do is sit down and say, well, what does God want me to do? And how should I treat myself? And how should I treat others? In fact, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 up until verse 6, what we find out is that we should not be judging one another. In fact, Paul says he didn't judge himself. Why? Because he might be doing something he didn't realize. Have you ever done something wrong that you didn't realize was wrong, but you was right in the middle of it? And you didn't find out until way later that it was wrong. But at the time, you were doing everything right. See, life is like that, isn't it? And so if we're going to 
live by God's standards, we've got to have God's standards for our own lives. And then we're going to extend grace and mercy to everybody else as well. See, that's an amazing thought. Their situation. Why did Paul need to tell them that? Because they were divisive. They were thinking they were better than each other. They were arrogant or proud against, proud against one another. They were not coming together as the Lord's body. They're argumentative every time they come together. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 11 and 12 and other places. So what, what's some of our examples for us? So we understand that we, we have to hold to what God's Word says. It's not about what I say or what I do and what you say and what you do. And at the end of the day, it's really about what God says and what God wants us all to be doing. See, that's, that's the key. So what I want us to do briefly this morning, I want us to think about three individuals from Old Testament Scripture. And as I think, we think about these people, I want to draw our minds back to something. What happened to them, and why did it happen? What happened to them, and why did it happen? For Le 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 Leviticus chapter 10, if I don't get tongue-tied saying it too many times, Leviticus chapter 10, notice what he says starting in verse 1. There's two gentlemen, his name Nadab and Abihu, these are Aaron's sons. Okay, the high priest is Aaron, these are his sons, and they're coming to offer a sacrifice. Okay, so when they offer the sacrifice, there are certain things that were supposed to happen in certain ways. They were used to fire from the altar, to light incense. There, like I said, there was over and over and over, there were things they were to do as prescribed. There was no guesswork in this. And notice what happened. So then Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10, 1, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it and offered profane fire before the Lord. You might have the word strange there, which he had not commanded. And the idea was they were worshiping God in a way he had not commanded. However, they changed that order of worship. However, it was, you know, where exactly they got this fire from or what censor they had. I mean, like I said, when you read Leviticus, it, it is laid straight out how they're supposed to do it. Whatever it was, they decided to do what God had not commanded in worship to him. Now, I want us to think about this for just a minute and say, well, what, what's the big deal about that? Why is that so important? Why is it important to think about worship? Because we are not the recipients of worship. We're not the one that receives the worship. Who receives the worship? God receives the worship. We honor God. We don't sing to honor ourselves. I don't preach to honor myself. You know, we don't give to honor ourselves. That shouldn't be the deal. What we do, we give to God, and that's that we lay it before Him, as if you will, in front of His feet, and that's, that's how we should behave and act when we think about worship. And so somebody might ask, well, what was worship like today? Well, it was great. We got to worship God the whole time. And yet, there are times I hear people, you've heard them too, I just get, didn't get nothing out of it. Well, did you bring a bucket? Did you bring a bucket? You know, what do you mean? Well, did you bring something to, to pour into somebody? Did you, did you bring something to get filled up with? Did you, what, what did you bring? I'm not talking about an attendance card. I'm talking about a bucket. Did you come to contribute and give something away? Did you come to give your heart away to the Lord today? That's really something to think about. We're not, you know, when we talk about being commanded to come, there's more than just being here. It's what we do while we're here. That's why we're to come together. To honor our most holy God and to build up one another, encourage one another, stir up or literally agitate one another to love and good works. It's that Hebrews 10, 25 passage, 24, 25 passage. The idea is we're here to, to honor God and help one another. That's, that's why we're here. Don't go beyond what's commanded. Don't add anything to the worship service. It is as God wants it to be. If He wanted us to add things, He would have told us. You cannot read Leviticus and say God doesn't know how to command what He wants. So in the New Testament, what do we do? We sing. From the heart. Now what happens to Nadab and Abihu? Fire comes out from the Lord and devours them. Not good things. 
probably not the outcome they desired or thought of. Turn the Bibles to the book of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, we have God talking to Joshua. Moses has already, di- has already died. And Joshua is now in command of the Lord's armies, so to speak, the Lord's people. He's, he's going to lead the people through the Jordan into the promised land, and they're going to take the promised land because God is going to give it to them. And notice how, how God talks to Joshua. Notice what he says in verse 5. He says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Notice, I'm not, he's not going to leave Joshua at any point in time. Be strong and courageous. Notice how he goes on to say in verse 6, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you should divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may obtain, observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Now notice what he told Joshua. He says, I'm not going to leave you. Be strong. Be of good courage or be courageous. Don't let my word leave your lips. Don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. Just hope, stay with me, and we're going, to get, we're going to get through this. So we have going to Jericho. Great big victory. Joshua, listen to what God said. Great victory occurs. Wonderful things happen. So then he sends out a delegation, some spies out, check out AI. And as he checks them out, and they come back with a report, we don't, we don't need all these people to go. No, no, we just need a handful of people to go. See, in Jericho, they were to destroy everything, leave nothing behind, burnt offering to the Lord. I mean, it was all supposed to be burnt up and gone. So Joshua sends this small delegation out. Spies come back, he sends out a small unit to go take, attack Ai and capture it. What happens? They get utterly defeated. They are put to shame. They are want to run away. Now you'd say, well, here's a man named Joshua. God said, I'm going to be with you. I will not leave you. Be strong. Be of good courage. Hold my words in your mouth. God is with you. We suffer a defeat, a setback. It's not how it looks. So what does Joshua do? Verse 6, then Joshua 7, verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth, uh, to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening he and the elders of Israel and they put dust in their heads. It's mourning. It's a sign of mourning. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say to the, when Israel turns its back on its enemies? He goes on to say, when the inhabitants of the hear this, they're going to come after us. Now, does that sound like somebody who's strong and brave and courageous and listening to the Lord? Because if he listened to the Lord, what would he have known? God said, I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will give you the land. God, why would you bring me here to destroy me? Have you ever sat and thought about that? He didn't hold on to God's word very hard. He went on his own way. He made his own conclusions. It's not how I thought it would be. You're coming to destroy us? I thought you were coming to deliver us. And you remember God's answer. There was sin in the camp. A man named Achan took things that belonged to God. That was the problem. See, he should have looked around and found out what the problem was. What the sin in the camp was. See, when we live our lives, is it not the same? We step out and face it, God, whatever happens, I'm with you. You step out, bad time happened. God, I knew you weren't going to be with me this time. No, look around. What in our life isn't right? See, that's something to think about, isn't it? It's hard to be blessed when all we want to do is not the right thing. So we've got to hold on what God says. Does that mean everything will be rosy? No, it does not mean everything will be rosy. Well, that means when things are not rosy, who you're holding on to. 
the same God when everything is rosy. See, that's it. When the life is really good, you're holding on to God. When life is really not good, we still hold on to God. We don't let go and say, well, God must have left me. That's not how that works. You've got to hold on to him. Last example is a man named Jonah. A man named Jonah. You remember his, his, his message. You remember his book. It starts out. God talks to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. What did Jonah do? And there's a prophet of God that said, I'm not going to go speak for God. I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm not going to speak. That doesn't work very well. You remember how it goes. He goes on the boat. He's asleep. God makes a great big storm come up. They're trying to figure out what's going on that has this sea trouble. They find Jonah there. Want to know what he's doing sleeping. Jonah tells them why they're in a mess. Tells them, just throw me overboard. It'll be fixed. They drew straw, just in case he wouldn't write. They worshiped God. They threw him overboard. And a great big fish swallows him right up. Jonah rethinks his previous decision. Right after that fish vomits him up on the land, he goes and decides he's going to preach. Repent for 40 days and then of a parish. That's, that's the message. That's the message. Have you ever sat back and said, why did Jonah just not want to go? I mean, we might get in our mind that he was shy and didn't want to, and that's, that's not the case. You might get in our mind that he had a better thing to do. We might say in our mind that he had another plan. There's another way to do this. But what does Jonah say? Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. Because after all, Jonah, after he gets done preaching, he goes up on his high mountain, overlooks that great city, and he's ready for it to come down. He's, he's ready to see it be destroyed. But no, God doesn't destroy it. He has mercy because they repented. Notice what he said. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. But this pleased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know you are great, a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah, why didn't you want to go preach? Because they would be saved. What? Jonah? He didn't go preach because they would be saved if he went. Could you imagine telling the ho a whole city what God wants? Them turning and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that was terrible. I wish I never came here. God, just kill me. I want to die now. That's what he's saying. Whose will was he more interested in? God's will or his own? After all, the Assyrians were his enemies. He goes on after God made his plant and made a worm eat the plant. He still got upset over that. God asked Jonah the question in verse 10. He says, but the Lord said, you have had pity on a plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the right hand and the left, and much livestock? There's so much life there you're worried over one little plant that you didn't do nothing for and there's all these people and you don't even care about them see when we start thinking about this idea of going beyond what is written if we go beyond what is written go beyond what God's word says what God's word teaches we draw conclusions that do not bring us closer to God, they bring us further away from God. We're not a better Christian when we make our own decisions outside of God's will. It, it doesn't work like that. We're a better follower of Jesus when we hold fast to those words. Hold fast to His will for our lives. Get on those old paths. That's what Jeremiah wanted them to get on, those old paths, those faithful paths. See, that's what we seek after. We should be following Him. 
See, all this division, this religious division, especially in Christianity, that we, that we encounter, all these different teachings, comes from not following God's will or God's word, but man's will and man's works. See, that's what it, that's what it comes down to. It's not that God has given all these different teachings to all these different places. That's, that's not it. It's because God has given one teaching and they've manipulated it through the century. What would happen if we held on to that word? What kind of person would we be like? What kind of people would we be like? What would happen if we saw each other instead of just people, but souls on their way to eternity? What would that look like? What if it, when we woke up in the morning, instead of when we look in the mirror and we see that little drool and that little piece of broccoli, what if instead of seeing that, we look at what our soul looks like in the mirror? What would that look like? See, when we read God's Word, guess what it shows us? It shows us what the soul looks like. See, that's what it shows us. It shows us where we're going. So you don't have to brush your hair. Just look at me. Haven't in a long time. But you got to find out what your soul looks like. Hair is temporary. The soul's eternal. Hold on to these words. Today, what's your life like? Is it one that holds on to the words of God? Or is it one that kind of passes them off as if it never heard it? Or is it one that changes you? I know what it says, but i got a life to live. Why change it? It's perfect. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, do you live like he's the Christ today? Do people through your manner of living know that you believe that Jesus is the Christ? If not, why not? See, today is a new day. Today is a new day. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in 2 Corinthians 6 2, today is the day of salvation. It's today. You can change your manner of life today. If you're not yet put Christ on baptism, what's holding you back? If you believe in Jesus, you're willing to tell people he's the Christ, you're willing to repent or change your life in accordance with that fact, put him on a baptism, have those sins washed away. But if you've done that and life has become hard and you turned away from what God's word says, repent. Pray, come back to Him. And if you need, we can pray with you and we can pray for you. If you have a need, let it be known. Come forward and we sing a song of invitation.